anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. We're going to take the next five to six hours to walk in real time. <laughs> Up and down Cemetery Ridge. We're going to go into town. We'll stop at O'Rourke's. We'll come back here, which is fun. But no, we'll take about 90 minutes. We're going to walk. We're going to do a lot of talking, a little bit of walking for most of you. We'll orient you to where you're standing here in a moment. We're going to talk about the federal uh, defense here at Gettysburg, the Confederate assault. We're going to see some pictures. I know you're surprised Gary's bringing pictures with him. <laughs> but the one thing uh, I want to mention, first off, and I'm not joking, Gary was in a bicycle accident the other day. He has hurt his ribs. So whenever he does speak, feel free to move in a little bit closer because he is having some problems whenever he's uh, trying to project. Uh, so feel free to move in a little bit closer. I can't yell. Yeah, he cannot yell. I can't yell. And uh, if it comes to it, I'll stand beside him and be his megaphone. Um, the hand. other thing I want to uh, mention is that if you haven't checked out the American Battlefield Trust 160th anniversary videos yet, you have missed the fact that Gary is going to shave his beard tomorrow. It's actually tonight. You get the vote on what he looks like. Oh. Sickle. So we have Strong Vincent, Arthur Fremantle, Strong Vincent, oh. Patty O'Rourke. So if you have any votes, make sure you get those in. And uh, we'll see what Gary comes up with tomorrow. We'll debut it live during our pickets charge. Uh, walk across those fields tomorrow afternoon. And so, you can just vote by telling me to. Yeah, yeah, walk up to him, tell him, and uh, he may or may not mark the vote that he really wants. <laughs> and by the way, he came up with this idea. We did not. So he has no one to blame but himself. Now, uh, as we get started here, I want to uh, introduce you to the south end of the Gettysburg Battlefield. It's July 2nd, 1863. It's roughly around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and things are starting to move around out here. Uh, Doug is going to come up here in just a few moments to describe the Union movements. I'll describe the Confederate movements, but to orient you to where you're standing, we are south of the town of Gettysburg, which is to the north of us, or behind where I'm speaking right now. The Confederate line along Seminary Ridge is off to my right, out towards the west, out towards the mountains, off in the distance will be Pittsburgh, Ohio, and beyond, out to the west. To the south of us, that low plateau that you might be able to see, is the peach orchard. Just peeking up above it is what we call the Longstreet War Department Tower. I have a uh, announcement from the Park Service. There's an active yellow jacket nest right there. So we want to move oh about 20 steps, mother may I, <laughs> off in this direction. Oh, you're not okay? Sorry for those of you who had good shade and good chairs. <laughs> uh, bring an umbrella. But that's what it is. Sorry to interrupt. No problem, man. There you go. We're not going to talk. Yeah, I don't want to challenge you. Yeah, that's good. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it, y'all. Leave them be, Yeah. Now that we're recreating the sunken road at Antietam, <laughs> you guys are some real nerds. I like you. you know what I mean? <laughs> so what we're uh, what we're looking at is the peach orchards to the south of us. It's a low plateau that has about 10 acres of peach trees that were owned by fruit dealer Joseph Scherfe. Just beyond it, now I can't see it, but it's out there, is the War Department Tower we call the Longstreet Tower. And the nice thing about the War Department Tower, you can only see about the top deck of it from here. So that's going to give you a better perspective of what the Confederates can and cannot see. That will go along Seminary Ridge, down to Warfield Ridge, and then due to the, to the south, southeast, we will have the round tops, big and little round top. Off to my left will be Cemetery Ridge, running parallel with Seminary Ridge, up towards Cemetery Hill, and then off to the east towards Culp's Hill. So that's where you're standing here on the battlefield. Along the Emmitsburg Road, you might notice that there is some high ground. We cannot see the Confederates from where we're standing. The Confederates cannot see us. During the American Civil War, we used what we call direct line of sight. If you can see it, you can shoot it. Today, we use indirect fire, forward observers radioing back using map coordinates. We could plunge fire into this area. And fire will be plunged into here, but blindly, largely, as this battle starts off. 
Later on, as the Confederates move cannon up into that peach orchard, we will then become a target in this area. We'll develop that story for you. But as we stand out here in the afternoon of July 2nd, 1863, we are near the Trossel farm. We are on the farm of Abraham Trossel. This is one of the iconic uh, structures on the Gettysburg battlefield. We have many farms, and I want you to think of this south end of the field as a community. We have the Klingles, the Sherfies, the Wentzes, the Trossels, and many others who live out here. Some of them have small farms, larger farms, but they will all be interconnected and they'll be fought over by the Union and Confederate forces. The Trossels will be kicked out of their house in the midst of a meal. So as they're kicked out of their home, we're seeing displaced civilians across this battlefield. Some will stay in their homes or their basements, while others will flee to the east, to the south, or safety of the town itself if they were able to get there. So this is what it's looking like. And now on July, uh, the end of July 1st, we remember north and west of the town, we had fighting with the 1st and the 11th Corps for the Federals. The Union 3rd Corps comes in from the west. The, Union, uh, the Confederate 2nd Corps comes in from the north, and they push those Federals back to Cemetery Hill. Culp's Hill, and then on to Cemetery Ridge. A line starts to form out there that we'll call that famous fish hook. Looks like an upside down J. And then around two o'clock in the afternoon on July 2nd, everything's gonna go upended for the Union commander, George Gordon Meade, because one of his generals goes rogue on him and moves forward to about where we're standing. So if we think about that, at the end of the July 1st battle, we know George Gordon Meade's going to arrive on the battlefield at about midnight. We know at some point late in the morning he's going to ride his line, and as Chris said, the line's going to take the shape of a fish hook. That is the line that Meade wants to fight, and it kind of makes sense. If his right's on high ground, that's good. The center's on high ground at Cemetery Hill. The rest of it is on Cemetery Ridge, and he wants to anchor the left on Little Round Top. Now his left would be on high ground. And although that's a three mile long line, there are enough farm lanes and independent roads in there that he could move forces back and forth. So those interior lines, that's our Jomini for the day. All right, so he can use this as a good defensive position. Now, when me gets done riding it, no, that is his plan. That's what he intends to fight. But that line is not all filled up yet. It's gonna go ahead and be filled as units arrive on the field. So we know the second corps is gonna arrive and they'll basically take to where the Pennsylvania Monument or the Dome Monument is. Finally, about three o'clock in the morning, we're gonna have the third corps arrive, commanded by Meade's only non-West Point Corps commander, Major General Daniel Edgar Sickles. I'm sure most people are familiar with his career. He is a, not a military man by trade. He's part of the Tammany Hall political machine, goes to Washington, D.C. Uh, as a congressman with his 16-ish year old wife, uh, he uh, gets down there, of course, he's, he's a, you know, a bit of a cad, so he gets girlfriends around town. His wife gets a boyfriend, the district attorney of Washington, D.C., Philip Barton Key, Francis Scott Key's son. Uh, as often happens in these sordid affairs, Sickles is the last to learn, and when he does, he will figure out whatever their signal is, floating a little handkerchief. Uh, when he sees young Barton Scott Key come across Lafayette Square, he will run out with a brace of three pistols, shoot him in the chest, shoot him in the groin. The third is a misfire, broad daylight, 12 witnesses, he's arrested. But of course, he's a gentleman, so we allow him to keep his sidearms while he's in jail. Uh, he was put together the first legal dream team in the United States, including Edwin Stanton, who's now Secretary of War. Uh, he will get him off in the first use of temporary insanity in the U.S. legal system. Now, all this is to say it hasn't been good for him politically. So what happens, though, is the American Civil War. When Abraham Lincoln would call for 300,000 more, if you were an enterprising individual, you'd go recruit 1,000 people, and they might elect you the colonel of the regiment. He doesn't recruit 1,000, he recruits 5,000. And so they make him a brigade commander. And after a year and a half of war, people have been killed, people have been promoted. He is now the third corps commander responsible for 10,000 men. Now, if, as Chris talked about, when we sit down here, notice there's high ground out in front of us. And one of the things that Dan Sickles is concerned about is that he has the only low ground in the Union line, and he doesn't like that. And then a series of events are going to happen. First of which is, he's not exactly sure where he's supposed to be, but after multiple levels of guidance from Meade sending his son, who's now his aide, to go tell him where to be, to Sickles literally going to Meade's headquarters and telling him where he wants him to be, ultimately, what Sickles realizes two things. First of all, about 11 o'clock in the morning, Buford's cavalry's out in the peach orchard. Makes sense. 
Cavalry is watching the flanks of the Army. They get permission to go refit back in Maryland after the first day's fight. Problem is, it was always expected that they would be replaced before they left, so they leave. For Sickles, he's like, oh man, now I'm in low ground. There's no longer cavalry operating on our flanks. And so what he does is send some of his own men to the far tree line, and who do they run into? Longstreet's flank marks get in position to make attack. That's the last straw for Sickles. So at about 2.30 in the afternoon, he's going to move his 10,000 men from back of the tree line behind us to out here. What do we mean by out here? From the first red barn, the trossel barn with the, the white spires, to the second red barn, to the third red barn at the Sherfy house. And then at the peach orchard, his line bends 90 degrees, goes through that tree line, and comes up just short of Little Round Top. Now there's some problems with this. First things first, he now created a half mile gap in the Union line. That's a problem. The end of the Union line is no longer on Little Round Top. That's a problem. Uh, he has about 10,000 men, which would have been about right for back there. But for this extended line he's now taken up, he's got about half of what he needs. That's a problem. It's got a 90 degree bend in it, can be tacked in two sides. That's a problem. And he never tells me that he's going to do this. Also a problem. <laughs> so what happens is about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he's going to call for a Corps Commander's meeting because he has to talk to all of his senior commanders since he took command five days ago. Sickles will be late, standard. Meade will have to send his son to come out and get him. And then finally, when he shows up, as he arrives at Meade's headquarters, he says, he can hear the booming of Confederate artillery in support of their attack on July 2nd. He says, don't even get off your horse. I'll meet you out there. And when Meade finds out that he's out here, you can imagine, we know he's got this wicked temper. My gosh, General Sickles, what have you done? General Meade, there's high ground out here. And then you get to picture whatever sarcastic comment you think Meade makes. I'm partial to... There's high ground from here in the Rocky Mountains! <laughs> Either way, sensing the commanding general is no longer happy with his performance, he offers to pull back, but remember, Meade's fifth day of command, he goes, yes, General Sickles, you have gotten us into this, but I must get us out. And he makes four quick decisions, the first of which he'll send a note over to General Hancock. You're going to have to account for that half-mile gap. He's going to send a note to his fifth corps, his only reserve, 10,000 men that just arrived on the field this morning. You're going to have to support General Sickles. The Army of Potomac has an artillery reserve, 118 pieces of artillery. Fully 32% of the artillery in the Army of the Potomac belongs to the Artillery Reserve, meaning not assigned to any unit, owned by the Army of the Potomac commander to be able to place wherever he wants. So he's going to send a note to the Chief of Artillery, Henry Hunt, you're going to have to support this position. And as he rides off the Peach Orchard, furious, he turns over his right shoulder, looks at his Chief Engineer, Governor K. Warren, says, go up to that high ground and tell me what I've missed. This is how the Third Corps ends up out here as the Confederate attack starts to develop. Thanks, Doug. That was all one sentence, by the way. <laughs> so on the other side, we have this guy named Robert E. Lee. If you haven't heard of him, don't pass go, don't collect $200. He is the uh, Army Commander of the Army of Northern Virginia for the last 13 months. He's done pretty well for himself. He's won at places like the Peninsula. He's gone to Second Manassas. He has a draw at Antietam, goes on to Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, victorious at both of those places. Now we have seized the uh, initiative here in the Eastern Theater and started moving north as Mr. F.J. Hooker, as he calls him, is dealing with some political problems in the Union Army. Lee arrives here at Gettysburg, is going to fight the first day's fight north of the town and to the west of the town, and then he is going to start to come up with a plan on July 2nd of 1863. Now we have to remember, when we start looking at maps of this battlefield, you're seeing one second of a day. These two armies are living, breathing <coughs> entities. They're constantly going to be moving. You constantly need to have a flow of information coming from your front lines, then sent up the chain of command. Orders are sent back down the chain of command, and that way you can put together and formulate an actual battle plan. There's a lot of misconceptions about Lee's battle plan on July 2nd. First and foremost, that he was going to make a uh, dawn assault here at Gettysburg. That's untrue because he doesn't even have a plan put together because he still has scouts to the south of us trying to figure out what was out here at that time. By the time these scouts come back to Army headquarters and there's a debate amongst James Longstreet, Lee's second in command, his old war horse, as well as Lafayette McClaws, one of Longstreet's division commanders, and John Bell Hood of what to do, that is going to take time. And that is going to take throughout most of the morning of July 2nd. Now, Lee will come up with a plan. He is going to try and uh, move Longstreet's Corps, or at least two-thirds of it, down behind a ridgeline to the west of us. The idea is to move them down to a point 
where they can then deploy on the left end of the federal line, which Lee thinks is somewhere in that vicinity of that peach orchard. There, they can use the Emmitsburg Road as a guide or an axis of advance. They can advance north, and they can sweep them out of that direction, sweep the Federals away. At the same time, Lee's men can take the desired ground, as he calls it. That will be the Peach Orchard, which will be a nice flat uh, platform for your artillery. That's what he comes up with for down on this end of the battlefield. He'll also be working with some other new Corps commanders here. Second Corps is now under the, uh, the command of Richard Stoddard Ewell and an army of an eccentrics. He could be the most eccentric officer. Ewell is taking command of Stonewall Jackson's old Second Corps. He has moved his corps mostly into the town of Gettysburg and then to the east of it. When Lee meets with Ewell repeatedly on July 1st and July 2nd, Ewell basically says, this is terrible ground over here to, to attack. We shouldn't attack. Okay, we should move you around and support Longstreet. No, we shouldn't do that either. <laughs> Lee buys into this and allows the Second Corps to be in this really strange position. Then linking the Second Corps and the First Corps will be Ambrose Powell Hill, West Point graduate of the class of 1847. He has every malady known to man. He's a hypochondriac at times. He is a fantastic division commander. Once he reaches Corps command, the wheels are going to start to come off for AP Hill. He started the Battle of Gettysburg by basically having Lee right up to the cash down in. Lee saying, hey, what's going on down the road there? I hear some cannon and AP Hill pretty much telling him, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not what you want to tell your boss on your first day on the job up here as a Corps commander. But Hill will be the link between Longstreet's men who are moving down behind Seminary Ridge as well as Richard Ewell's Corps straddling Gettysburg and out to the east towards Fenner's Hill and those other parts of the battlefield. Now, as this uh, movement starts to take place, Federals on top of Little Round Top can actually see out in the distance a signal station, see out in the distance this moving column of men. Two divisions of Longstreet's Corps, his third under George Pickett, is still to the rear and will not be here for July 2nd. These two divisions will be moving in this direction, led by Lafayette McClaw. When McClaws and his men arrive across from the Peach Orchard along West Confederate Avenue today, about 600 yards from the Peach Orchard, all of a sudden it's like, hey, there aren't supposed to be that many Yankees out there. What should we do? And Longstreet comes down. He is going to decide to extend his battle line farther to the south. In fact, he's going to wrap, wrap, wrap around where eventually John Bell Hood's division is actually pointed towards the northeast towards what we know as the Valley of Death, towards the Devil's Den, and then what becomes known as the Wheat Field. As all this is playing out, it takes time. Throughout the day, this is what's precious on this battlefield. We will talk about time. Time will be bought in lives out here at times, and other times it will move like the sun is just inching across the sky to these soldiers who are trying to hold on to these lines, or to crush these lines. But Longstreet meets with John Bell Hood, West Point graduate of the class of 53, and Hood basically says it's a really bad idea to attack in that direction. And Longstreet says, well, that's what the commanding officer wants, that's what the, the general wants, that's what he's going to get. And Hood will launch an assault that will start to roll up first towards Devil's Den, they'll make contact down there, then they will start to move off towards Little Round Top and then towards the wheat field, which is directly behind many of you, just off to the, to the uh, southeast. And this will draw in the majority of John Bell Hood's division. As these men start to engage, that means that Meade's going to have to start to react, sending troops down in that direction, sending more troops out here. But the delay is important because... George Gordon Meade earlier in the day had been contemplating making an assault out on the right flank of the Union Army. If you read the initial reports of the 5th Army Corps for the Federals, you'll see many of them will mention a place called Wolf's Hill. And if you look at your map, that's beside Culp's Hill. In fact, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain thought at one point he was fighting on that side of the field when he wrote his first report. Then in his second report, he realized he was on Little Round Top. So as you start to see this come to play, 
because it's taking more time to get around to the south, that's going to give me time to realize that, okay, Sickles has moved forward. Now I can start shifting my mobile reserve, the 5th Army Corps, Meade's old corps itself, over to this part of the battlefield, while we have more troops still coming onto the field under the 6th Corps. And block by block, Confederate brigades will start to attack up into this area. We'll start to see John Bell Hood, which will then will transition into Lafayette McClaws' division, which will target the area where we're standing. No, I was going to. All right, so here's how this breaks down. This attack is going to roll from south to north. If you want to think about domino number you know, one is at four o'clock, uh, domino number two at about five o'clock, just south of the Peach Orchard. Uh, later on, Chris is going to talk about as the Confederates hit the Peach Orchard, this would be William Barksdale's brigade. This is going to shatter that salient, that 90 degree bend, and now the line starts to break. It's about the time that Dan Sickles has his headquarters here at the Trossel Farm. In fact, we have a wonderful drawing of this uh, by Charles Wellington Reed, literally down by the tree right around the corner of what his headquarters looks like. Now, there's people that disagree about what time this happens, but you can imagine, imagine Confederate artillery rounds shooting at Union troops up on the Peach Orchard are overshooting. And they're landing amongst this headquarters position. In fact, it first was up here, and aides will make the recommendation we should move our headquarters off of this position. And it's about this time that a shell will come down and hit Dan Sickles just below the knee. Um, now, as he falls from his horse, a couple of soldiers will come over and catch him. And what they're going to do is take him over and rest him alongside the Trossel Farm. Now, there's a, not that many people around. Uh, if you think about it, one of the guys who is around is his chief of artillery, the third corps chief of artillery. Hang on, I got a picture of him for you. Here you go. It's Captain George Randolph. He's here. You can imagine because it's a central position. And he notices that Sickles is in pain. In fact, you could argue he's in shock. And he says there's hardly anybody around. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Sickles' main aide, or his senior aide, is Major Henry Tremaine. Uh, and he's all over this battlefield. He's the one who rides up and talks to Reynolds on day one that says, hey, you better bring the Third Corps up. Uh, he's the one who visited Meade's headquarters twice this morning. What he says is, Sickles is mostly concerned about his line being ready to collapse. If you read Randolph's report, Sickles is mostly concerned about bleeding to death. <laughs> uh, but he does note in a very calm voice, which starts off as a handkerchief, he will soon direct one of his aides to go get a strap off his saddle and use that as a tourniquet. Henry Tremaine was kind of sends off to go get an ambulance, but he's worried about how long it will take. His point being, he doesn't go personally because he fears that if he goes to find that ambulance, Dan Sickles might die all alone. And so what's going to happen is eventually he says an ambulance shows up uh, during that time. He also says Dan Sickles pulls out the tiniest flask any soldier ever carried into battle. That does not <laughs> correspond to what I think Dan Sickles should carry, which should basically be, you know, a, a backpack full of whiskey. But either way, <laughs> he starts to go ahead and use liberal amounts of alcohol to go ahead and keep him calm. Uh, an ambulance does show up. Tremaine is convinced somebody else had called for it from somewhere else. And in utterly keeping with Dan Sickles, he pilfers that ambulance. <laughs> they will put him into the ambulance without a whole lot of fuss. Uh, one of the chaplains of his old Excelsior Brigade will come up and give him final rites. And he will issue alcohol liberally, <laughs> says the chaplain. Um, eventually what they do is the ambulance is going to go back. They'll meet up with Dr. Sim. He is the medical director of the 3rd Corps. Dan Sickles now becomes his medical case. He will take him back to a Third Corps hospital over on the Tawny Town Road. And it will be there that night uh, with the help of Dr. Calhoun, who is a doctor in the U.S. regular army. They will take a door, lay it out, and then they use all the Victorian era language. Imagine chloroform, imagine candles, imagine saws and knives, and that's all they say. As they go to amputate his leg, they realize why he got hit below the knee it's actually his knee has also been shattered, so it's amputated above his knee. And then what they realize is, normally, we would just go throw that in a stack. But Dan Sickles' leg is really important. <laughs> and so we can't just be throwing that around willy-nilly. So what they're going to do is they're going to wrap that up, and Dan Sickles will keep it with him. What they're going to do is uh, they will now put together a uh, body of men, 40 of them, uh, to carry his body because they're not going to waste an ambulance, however important he is, to get him out of here. And so what they're going to do is they're going to take, uh, make it say they form teams of 10. 
and they're going to go ahead and carry his body, certainly on July 3rd, about four miles away from here. <laughs> finally, he'll get to Littlestown, and then finally he'll get on a train. And by the 5th of July, he'll be in Washington, D.C., and that's where he's made comfortable. Of course, on the 5th of July, Abraham Lincoln will also visit Dan Sickles with his son, Tad. How lovely for his child to go see that. <laughs> <laughs> Progressive parenting. It, made, it reminds me of Abraham, Abraham Trosel. You know he's not here with his wife, Catherine, right? 1860 census, they have 11 kids. Uh, Abraham Trostle's in a sane asylum because he has 11 kids. <laughs> okay, that's neither here nor there. Here's the thing. Uh, you can imagine, though, when Abraham Lincoln talks to Dan Sickles, what story does Dan Sickles tell him? Does he tell him about how competent George Gordon Meade is? How What a wonderful new commander of the Army of the Potomac they found? I would argue it is on the 5th of July that Dan Sickles starts to poison the well for the relationship between President Lincoln and George Gordon Meade. Uh, of course, we can come back to finish the Dan Sickle story, but that takes us to the 5th of July. Gary, you want to talk about that one? I just wanted to jump in about Dan Sickles because uh, we have this alcohol theme going on, it sounds like, with Dan Sickles. Um, and um, Alexander Webb, if you're familiar with him, he is commanding the Philadelphia Brigade here at the battle up at uh, uh, the Angle here on July 3rd. And Alexander Webb, to say that he hates Dan Sickles is an understatement. He writes in the post-war years so many just hateful things about him. One of my favorite stories that came up from Webb was the fact that when Sickles was wounded here, that his leg did not need to be amputated. That he actually went to the rear and went to Dr. Sims, who refused to treat him and said, your leg's fine, move on. Then he went to another regular doctor, as he calls him, said, your leg's fine, move on. And it took a drunken, volunteer surgeon to <laughs> hack off Dan Sickles' leg, according to Alexander Webb. That's, how he, that's what he thinks of him. Now, the, the um, fraternity that is West Point really do not like Dan Sickles. And I found these quotes from Oliver Otis Howard. He might not be able to hold a flank on a battlefield, but he's really entertaining to read about. <laughs> so, he said this, I did not say this about Dan Sickles. He's describing Sickles' voice. He said, I can always remember Sickles' voice. It is a peculiar about a man like that. When they try to appear refined, they become effeminate. Now, Sickles is what you would call a rather coarse man. You could not call him a gentleman. And yet, when he talks, he talks like a sissy. <laughs> The same as a girl when she puts on men's clothing and tries to act like a man. She is apt to overdo it and talk like a Randy man. That's from Howard? That's, that is between Howard and a man named Kelly, who is an artist who is making many of the sculptures up here. So to get things right, Kelly meets with all these officers, and you want to talk about the real housewives of the Army of Potomac. <laughs> That's what this book should be called. It's like, you know what he did? Oh, I'll tell you what he did. And it, it's over and over again. And if you want it, it's called Generals in Bronze. It's a fantastic account of many, many generals, not just in the Army of the Potomac, but many of the, the high-ranking officers, including Sickles, and there's more in there. But that was Howard and Kelly talking. Not me. I didn't call him a sissy. He got his leg blown off. I'm, I'm not saying that about him. Last no, no, I still don't get to go. Oh, sorry. Hey, last thing I want to say. This. So how many people think Dan Sickles says he's carried off the field is smoking a cigar? Is that the story? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe, yes. That's the story. Yeah. Right? So it's interesting because all of those stories really come out starting in about 1879. Um, and what it really is, is a, a, there's a newspaper reporter, Whitlaw Reed, who sees Dan Sickles on July 3rd, arresting on the Baltimore Pike Lane on a stretcher with his hat down over his eyes and a cigar in his mouth. And that's what he writes about. Later on, it's conveyed as hearing that his men might think he's dead, uh, that he now puffs jauntily or dauntingly or however you want to describe it on his cigar. But the interesting thing is, if you read all the actual accounts from the day of the battle, Tremaine doesn't mention a cigar, uh, Randolph doesn't mention a cigar, Dr. Sim doesn't mention a cigar, and Dr. Sim talks to the press on the 7th of July, and he doesn't mention it then, and Dan Sickles doesn't talk about a cigar. Now, I'm sure, after he had his leg blown off and it was amputated, he had many cigars. 
I'm just not so sure it was on July 2nd. <laughs> all right, here. Good. Thank you, y'all. Uh, so first of all, I, I would like a favor. Should I need this later with my wife, please tell her that not only did I speak the least at this battle walk, I was the least talker, but I was also the most quiet one. This would be a, a great surprise to her, I assure you. Uh, trust me, she says I project, but not today. So I'm ready for the nerd edition a little bit here. We've gotten a lot of great overview, and we're going to get into some detail with some of the fighting on both sides of this barn here, OK? But when people talk about the Battle of Gettysburg, they often talk about what's going on in the wheat field in that direction. They talk about the peach orchard. They talk about the Kadori thicket. They talk about the Trosa farm, but they don't talk about some of that ground in between it. And that is those woods I'm looking right at right there. They're called Trosa's woods. Apparently, the woods belong to the person to the north. That's the Trosel Woods, and this is Trosel House. There's Kadori Thicket, and that's the Kadori House over there. So apparently that's how it works. So I'm just going to go into a little bit of nerd level here about what's going on on and around those woods. Because when Sickles moves forward, he needs some reinforcements. And up comes two of the brigades of James Barnes' division, the two that didn't go to Little Round Top with Vincent, Schweitzer, and Tilton. Okay, And they're going to be in those woods over there facing in two different directions. That's not quite enough, so let's get some members of some of the other uh, units that are out here. Burling's New Jersey Brigade that gets parceled out all over the battlefield, and they're in those woods for a little, a little while. They're going to set up guns on both sides of those woods. You've got some guns under Winslow in the wheat field. You've got Bigelow's guns over there. We're going to talk about them before long as well. And they're right near those woods as well. On the other side of those woods over there, that's where Strong Vincent probably is when the rider going to find General Barnes is flagged down by Vincent where he says, what are your orders? And Vincent will go from there off toward Little Round Top. So already, these woods and the area around it are playing some important parts there. When things don't go well for the Union in the wheat field, they need some help. What do they get? A division from the Second Corps, Caldwell's division. And remember, I think that's the first one you should memorize. If you want to know the Battle of Gettysburg, memorize the order of battle by brigades. And the first division you should do, again, Corps, Division, Brigade, first division you should do is Caldwell, because it's Cross, Kelly, Zook, and Brook. In fact, let's say it together. <laughs> Cross, Cross, Kelly, Kelly Zook, Zook, and Brook. Brook. You're one fifty-fourth of the way there. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a little bit more than that. You're doing well, OK? Zook is going to go right through those woods. Kelly is going to go right through those woods on the way to the wheat field. Part of Cross's brigade might have touched those woods. And then the one in the back, Brooke, is probably going to go through those woods as well. And guess which woods they're going to retreat back through a little bit later in the day, along with the two brigades I already talked about, Tilton and Schweitzer's brigade, coming back through those woods as well. Now, let me pause for a second to say, that was a pause, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> for me, that was a pause. Um, let me pause to say that there is no trail through those woods, okay? You can't exactly go into those woods, at least not safely. It's thick. It's pretty nasty in there, right? But at least think about them when you go there. When you're thinking about the wheat field, don't think of it as this enclosed space. Doug and I probably got rained out or COVIDed out, but we were going to do a walk around the wheat field. Everything except the wheat field and around it. A lot of things are going on in the woodlots and in the general areas around it. Now, all of them retreat, and then there's a new part of the battle that we're going to be really focusing on here, right? Here comes Barksdale, okay? And some of Barksdale's elements are going to come right near this house. I think you might know this, one particular regiment. And along with them and behind them comes a whole other brigade of Georgians, Hen uh, uh, Wofford's Brigade of Georgians, okay? Thank you to whoever that was. I was struggling a little over there. William T. Wofford is coming down the, uh, down the Wheatfield Road over there, okay? And they're going to be in those woods as well before they head out in that direction. To try to stop them on the far side of the woods is another battery of Massachusetts soldiers. It's the second time I've mentioned them today, the third Massachusetts battery, right at the other side of those woods there. To bolster them while Wofford's getting there, here come the Pennsylvania Reserves. Some of them go right into the woods, as well as some Sixth Corps elements. So, I mean, who'd have thought uh, that all these woods you know, would have had any sort of a significant part in the battle. And in fact, there's one monument in those woods, and there's a path to it, and that is to the 6th Pennsylvania Reserves. If you're ever driving down the Wheatfield Road, you look left, there's a little clearing, and you can legally walk into that, check out that monument, of course, and then check out the line of the Pennsylvania Reserves there. So that was my quick summary of something nerd level that a lot went on on and around those woods. And there's also a cool monument to the Corn Exchange Regiment. They have multiple monuments here right at the edge of those woods. It's a cool place to sit, contemplate, and think about the state of the world. Now, um, anything to add, guys, before 
we're moving to our next state. Okay, I think it's best to go around the house there. We're gonna gather not in the road, not at the cannons, but in the yard between the house and the barn here, which is pretty cool. Yeah, okay. I saw that when I walked up, that's awesome. Sorry. So have you gone and seen it? No. So I thought it, you know you can, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I haven't done that yet. I'm hoping. Okay, well there you go. It's on the list. Yeah, that's it. It's on the bucket list. I can't really go full or work. I, just, I haven't been doing it long enough, but I hate long lists. Um, what's that? Go for the Robins? All right, man. All right, any others? I was kind of hoping for the Vincent, but it looks like O'Rourke is way in the lead. Vincent? Vincent. All right. This is probably a better looking dude. I need all the, uh, hey, what's happening here? No, no, no. Well, they did play, because I posted you over there, sir. <laughs> Guys? We really don't want people over there. If you've got to stay there, we can't make you move, but you've got to stay away from the road, okay? That's all. All right, so let's get back to our story. One of the things that we talked about, one of the four decisions that Meade makes is he sends to his uh, chief of artillery, Henry Hunt, and he's going to order batteries out here from Freeman McGillivray's Reserve Artillery Brigade. Uh, here's Freeman McGillivray, 37 years old, former ship captain, doesn't take a whole lot of gruff from anyone. He's going to send batteries out here. Uh, when we think about it, one of those batteries is going to be uh, the 9th Massachusetts Battery. We know it as Bigelow's Battery. Here he is. This is John Bigelow. Um, let's talk about the 9th Massachusetts Battery for just a moment. 9th Massachusetts Battery is raised in July of 1862. Uh, it's under the command of, a, of an Italian uh, man of war uh, who basically, as he gets them, he does a good job of raising the regiment, but soon lets discipline slip, and now they find themselves in the defenses of Washington. Morale plummets, they stop training, and they become a problem child. Um, and so that's where they are. One of the things the men are very <coughs> upset about is they're only playing soldier, they're not actually being soldier. Now, when we talk about this idea of Captain John Bigelow, he graduates from the Harvard class of 1861. He's the first one from that class to go ahead and enlist. He's going to become a uh, artilleryman during the Battle of Malvern Hill. His artillery battery commander will be uh, wounded. He will hop in and take command of a section. He will then ultimately become the battery commander, but he gets wounded. Uh, finally, about the time of Fredericksburg, so December 1862, he's now ill and he resigns. Apparently, that lasts like two months. Because then seeing how bad the war is going for the Union, he's going to write the governor of Massachusetts says, I want back in. And the governor says, I've got just the unit for you. And he's going to send her the defenses of Washington to uh, the 9th Massachusetts Battery. As he takes over, uh, what he does is realize these guys just haven't been led. So he's going to go ahead and become the ultimate disciplinarian. they got to wear full uniforms all the time. He has eight roll calls a day. He drills them and drills them and drills them. And they hate him. Uh, his bugler is a guy named Charles Wellington Reed. He says he's a tyrant. He's, he's a, an aristocrat. Worse than any regular, he treats us as if a slave owner treats his slaves. Except after a couple weeks of Bigelow doing this, the battery starts to shape up. The men start to take pride in what they're doing, 
And even Charles Wellington Reed has to recognize John Bigelow knows his business. Now what's going to happen is slowly he eases up on them, but as we know the numbers here at Gettysburg and how that happened, in order to try and plus up the numbers for the Army of the Potomac, they're actually going to raid the defenses of Washington and pull troops out. So on the 25th of June, the 9th Massachusetts leave the defenses of Washington. They're going to march 33 miles on their first day in the field. How do you think that goes? <laughs> That's on the 25th. On the 26th, they're going to cross the Potomac River. On the 27th, they'll be at Frederick. By the 30th, they're at Pawneetown. On the morning of July 2nd, at 5.30 in the morning, they will march to Gettysburg. They'll arrive at the center of the fish hook line where the artillery reserve belongs. Finally, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they're getting orders to come out here to support Dan Sickles. Their first position is just behind the house. In fact, one of the nice things about Charles Wellington Reed is he is an artist of some report. So he draws Sickles and his headquarters over there by that tree. In fact, finally, at about 4.30 in the afternoon, they're going to get their orders to advance. They'll advance across the road, and where you see that field over there, towards that cedar tree, is where they go, and maybe one of the best illustrations of a battery going into position in the American Civil War, that's where they go. As they head out there, they're going to take their first casualties. A guy named Henry Fenn gets hit in the head by an artillery shell. Uh, Bigelow talks about the men gathered around him because they've never seen a dead man before, and they ask permission to carry his body to the rear. And, of course, Bigelow will say, no! Get back to your guns and give as good as you've gotten. And he writes his wife afterwards, and he said, They looked at me horrified as if I were heartless. But he said, You will lose fewer men if you get to your guns. They'll take a position over there. Ultimately, what he's going to do is ride his line. He's got a, a bunch of young lieutenants with him. Uh, one of his best lieutenants is uh, this young kid on the, on the right. It's Lieutenant Erickson. He's 28 years old. He's from Sweden and a cabinet maker. An officious officer, works with energy. His center section is commanded by Richard Sweet Milton. He's a 23-year-old bookkeeper from Roxbury, Massachusetts. And his left section is commanded by Alexander Whitaker, a 21-year-old uh, who is efficient and helps him basically get through all the bureaucracy of the Army of the Potomac. When he gets out there, he recognizes his left section is being blocked. He'll shift it over to his right. And first, they're going to start taking long-range shots at basically Henry's uh, artillery battalion as part of Hood's division. And then, at about 6, 30, 45, 7 o'clock, the first shots at Robertson's Texas and Arkansas Brigade. Then at about 7, 5.30, he's going to hit Kershaw's South Carolina Brigade. In fact, he's going to be firing canister balls just across over at the Rose Farm. Uh, Joseph Kershaw will write, he'll be forever haunted by the sound of canister balls bouncing off the Rose House and Barn. Finally, what's going to happen, he's going to order some of his left regiments, the 2nd South Carolina Battalion, the 3rd Regiment, and the 8th Regiment, will start to wheel towards him. Bigelow knows he can't stay there because it's an unsustained artillery battery, no infantry support. He's getting ready to pack up when all of a sudden they get an order and they go back into the woods that Gary was talking about. <coughs> a, a, a miscarriage of orders is what it is. Finally, what's going to happen is about 6 o'clock in the evening, Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade will hit the people. Thanks, Doug. I, I want to step back uh, just for one moment. Doug mentioned the Rose Farm. One of the things that the combatants over near the Rose Farm talked about repeatedly was the haunting sound of the farm bell being hit by mini balls and other pieces of shrapnel coming towards it. And they would hear it every once in a while knowing that those mini balls were zipping over their heads. Stepping back to the Battle of Chancellorsville, the Union Third Army Corps had 18,000 men in it. It consisted of three divisions. Here at Gettysburg, 10,000 men, two divisions. Only one of them is led by a West Pointer, that's Andrew Humphreys. His division's up on that direction. Down to the south of us is David Bell Burney. Burney is an Alabamian, though he grows up in Philadelphia in an abolitionist family. Goes off to war to fight with the 23rd uh, Pennsylvania Infantry, known as Burney Zwabs, and then will rise in the ranks. And eventually you will take over the 3rd Army Corps here at Gettysburg after the wounding of Dan Sickles. That Union line here is going to be set up in what we call a salient position. It is a portion of the line that protrudes outwards, and at that apex point of it will be down at the Peach Orchard. So those guns that Doug was pointing out are facing basically towards the south. Then we have another line of infantry and guns facing out towards the west. They're trying to meet a threat from two different directions, and they have nowhere near the amount of men that they need to cover that front. So now we have gone from a core, one battle before, that sustained the second highest amount of casualties in the battle, which had 18,000 men, down to 10. Also stepping back to Chancellorsville, 
that was a pretty good battle for Robert E. Lee, wasn't it? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. They shot Stonewall Jackson, come on. <laughs> Trick question. Well, it was a good battle for most Confederates, not Stonewall Jackson. <laughs> But it was not a good battle for William Barksdale and his Mississippi Brigade. His Mississippi Brigade was left behind at Fredericksburg. And on May 3rd, 1863, they were holding the famed Maurice Heights, the sunken road and the stone wall there, when they were swept off the field by the Union 6th Army Corps. And in the wake of Chancellorsville, this guy nicknamed Lee's Bad Old Man, Jubal Early, who had been in command of Barksdale's brigade there, is going to start writing basically like, those guys cost me the battle. Those guys cost me the battle. Because this was one, one really black eye, other than shooting Stonewall Jackson, that Lee had from Chancellorsville. And Barksdale and Early will get into a match in the newspapers, telling each other what they think about them. Whereas Richard Yule is one of the most eccentric men in the Army, Barksdale and Early are two of the angriest men in the Army of Northern Virginia. And Barksdale is a 41-year-old lawyer. He's from Tennessee, goes down to Mississippi, becomes an editor of a newspaper, goes off to Congress. In fact, he's supposedly there when Preston Brooks is going to cane Charles Sumner on the House floor. He's supposedly holding people back. At another point, he's supposed to get into a, a, a brawl in the U.S. Capitol, and they start fighting with another, um, basically, anti-slavery abolitionist, and they start rolling around, and Barksdale's wig comes off. <laughs> Everybody starts to laugh, and that ends the fight. But Barksdale has a lot of fight in him. He's not a trained West Point officer. He's coming into this battle with a chip on his shoulder. In fact, it got so ugly between Early and Barksdale that Robert E. Lee himself stepped in and said, knock this off. He didn't want it. He did not only want his men to stop fighting each other, he didn't want it coming out in the newspapers. So coming up here to Chancellor to Gettysburg, uh -huh. we now have William Barksdale <laughs> down there ready to come into this battle. And when we come into battle, we can have a, a simple equation. Means plus will will equal the power of your assault force. And as we started moving up this line, we had long streets. First Division under John Bell Hood basically has shot its bolt. Now we're starting to see the second part of that come in, and that's LaFant McClaws' division. Joker Shaw, South Carolinian, leading men in. Paul Semmes, he would be leading in Georgians. And now William Barksdale is one of the last brigades Longstreet has to throw into this battle. We're starting to lose those means to win the, or to have more power, but we have a lot of will. But not all the time. Not every soldier is ready to go out and fight. As Barksdale's men start to watch an artillery bombardment of the Peach Orchard, they're at receiving counter-battery fire. And they look out in front, and you notice there are fences all over this battlefield. And those are really handy for farmers, but they're a real pain in the neck if you're trying to march men in a line of battle across these fields. So Barksdale's brigade is set up the 21st Mississippi on its right, 13th Mississippi towards the right center, 17th Mississippi, and then the 18th Mississippi on its left. And <laughs> they look out in front, they see these fences, and Company D of the 17th Mississippi is supposed to go take down some of these fences. Captain Cherry goes over to his first sergeant, and he says, hey, get some volunteers, send them out there to the no man's land, take down those fences. Sergeant goes over, asks the guys for volunteers, everybody kind of looks at their feet, <laughs> so he goes back to his captain he's like nobody wants to do it sir go get me volunteers goes back over everyone's looking at their feet again nobody's going in <laughs> so Cherry goes over and says I will assign the detail <clears throat> and in army parlance this means he is going to voluntold someone to go into action he goes over to two men he sends them out into no man's land one's man name is, is Jim Duke the other one, uh, his name is Woods Means. As they go out, the Yankees really don't fire at them because they didn't want those fences in the way in case they had to make a counterattack. So these two guys drop those fences, run back, everything's fine. Meantime, Barksdale is on his horseback. He's riding up to McClaws. Let me go in, boss. Let me go. No, I'm not allowed to let you go in yet. He rides up the Longstreet. 
He tells Longstreet, I'm ready to go in. <clears throat> Longstreet tells him, wait five minutes. We'll all be going in presently. And as the fighting in the wheat field is heating up, as we have Little Round Top petering out, Devil's Den falling to the Confederates, William Barksdale's men are unleashed on the peach orchard salient. They start to come to attention. Barksdale tells all of his officers, except for his staff, to dismount. They're going to walk in on foot. He's going to be an Auburn Charger, the 41-year-old kind of a barrel-chested guy who's not a great horseman. Rides around the front of the 21st Mississippi, out to the center of the brigade, and starts to lead them up over a wall through two of the batteries of E.P. Alexander's battalion that has been firing, and they start pushing across the fields right towards us. As they do this, the Federals try to <coughs> counterattack. We'll see Edward Bailey, 21 years young, taking his second New Hampshire out, trying to counterattack. The 68th Pennsylvania under Andrew Tippin will try to go out there, stop this advance, firing obliquely into the right flank of Barksdale's Mississippians. Specifically, the 21st Mississippi, we're going to talk a lot about here in just a moment. And as these Mississippians come forward, they have such drive, will, determination, they're ready to go in. Barksdale said, the line before you must be broken. To do so, let every officer and man animate his comrades by the personal presence in the front line. And believe me, you're going to see Barks Barksdale out here conspicuously making a target of himself. Now the 21st Mississippi goes to the point of the peach orchard. As they do so, think about a hand going around the corner of a table. And the 21st is going to make contact with the Federals and start to wrap around that peach orchard salient and they're going to start to swing north towards where we're standing. That is going to help to dislodge the left part of that salient, Bernie's division. Now, the other three regiments of Barksdale's brigade will go straight across the road towards the Sherpy farm and the Wentz house. As they do so, they're going to start engaging with Collis' Zwabs, the 57th Pennsylvania, as well as the 105th Pennsylvania. There is going to be fighting on both sides of the Emmitsburg Road. As this battle starts to heat up, Barksdale's men will make contact, and then something is going to happen that is kind of strange. They're going to follow the enemy as they keep firing and falling back. So Barksdale's men will be attacking in this direction, and as the enemy starts to pull back to the north, they keep contact with the enemy, and they are like dogs, a pack of dogs going forward trying to flush out rabbits. They're going to keep going forward, forward, forward. In the meantime, William Wofford's brigade of Georgians will actually push forward and keep going west, while Barksdale's men turn towards the northeast. So they've lost contact with each other. As they've lost contact with one another, Wofford, who according to one officer, um, is very brave and impetuous, <coughs> most of the time to disaster, as he says, will keep going towards that wheat field. Barksdale will one by one start dislodging the Federals. And the Federals have problems. They cannot see to the front in places. Sickles' men will be shifting from the left to the right at times, including the 73rd New York, part of the famed Excelsior Brigade. When they are positioned west, uh, east of the Emmitsburg Road, near the Sherpy Farm, they were behind a small rise and also behind two Pennsylvania regiments. So they couldn't fire into Barksdale's men until the, their front was uncovered by their own troops. And Barksdale's men will move so quickly that they're going to start engaging unit by unit by unit. And the left end of Sickles' line, or what's left of it, is starting to give way. Meade will keep throwing reinforcements up into this area. In the meantime, we need to start buying time for the Federals. And we'll have to do that with lives, we'll have to do that with innovation. And one of the men who's going to innovate down here will be John Bigelow and his 9th Massachusetts Battery who are falling back towards where we're standing. A way to get off of this battlefield was a w one gate. And many of Freeman McGilvery's guns that Doug pointed out will be pulling off of here, battery by battery, section by section, trying to get out of Dodge. And two Massachusetts batteries will be covering this retreat. So if we think about how that goes, but as Chris said, when the peach orchard explodes, now every one of those batteries along the wheat field road, Thompson's battery, Hart's battery, Phillips' battery, Feedman McGilvery's telling them, you gotta get out, 
you got to get back to the line to set up another defensive line. And that's working right until he gets up to Bigelow. And when he gets up to Bigelow, what he realizes is two things. First of all, the Confederates are already really close as they come down the Wheatfield Road. And the other thing is he's under pressure from Joseph Kershaw, South Carolinians, that are working through the woods that Gary was talking about. So what, what he's going to offer up is he cannot go ahead and get up and pull out. He's going to retire by prologue firing which effectively means we're gonna take the rope that's wrapped around the trail of the cannon. You're gonna go ahead and tie that back to your horses and your limber so that when it fires, it will now recoil. Buck up, roll back 15 yards, and then the horses will take the slack out of the rope. They'll continue to drag it back as the men reload this. Nobody does this in the American Civil War. This is a break glass in case of emergency and there's no emergency so desperate that you need to retire by prologue firing. Now, ultimately, what happens is Bigelow had his men trained to do this. Now, he's already down an officer. Lieutenant Erickson has been shot. He has to go to the rear, and then he finds him back in the line. Uh, and so what he's going to do is now retire by prologue firing. If you think about it, from that cedar tree on the ridge back behind us, back to this gate that Chris talked about, is 429 yards. For that, they say they fire five shots, and if you go, that's one aim shot a minute, that covers about 100 of those yards. The rest of it means that they are dragging the pieces, either by horse or by hand. And they say by the time they get back here, basically you can follow their path by looking at their dead horses and their men laying out in the field. Mm. Now, I know you all are Civil War experts, so how do you feel about your fields of view and fields of fire down here? Yeah, they're crummy. So what he does is, oh, by the way, this works. They retire by prologue firing until he gets down to this position. He goes, oh, good. We got a little cover in front of us. Now's the time to limber up, boys. We're going to head back. And then he knows Shreve McGilver is back in his position. Hey, uh, Captain Bigelow, nobody back behind you. Although Little Round Top has been saved as a Union Island, there's a 1,500-yard gap between Little Round Top and basically the Pennsylvania Monument. He goes, you must hold this position at all hazards. Bigelow knows this is a bad deal. But what he's going to do is he'll put his guns in a semicircular arc down here. He's going to violate protocol. They're going to gather the ammunition from their ammunition chests, and they're going to stack them next to their artillery pieces. You can imagine the two pieces to the left are firing canister over that ridge line to keep those skirmishers that are in the tree line back. For these men, they start off with shell and spherical case shot with fuses cut to explode at the mouth of the cannon. Finally, they're going to fire all of those, and then they're just going to start to fire solid shot that will bound over the ridge line. You can imagine those men from the 21st Mississippi are no fools. They don't want to attack directly into a battery. They start working around to his right. Meanwhile, Confederates are working around to his left. His position is slowly collapsing in upon itself because they don't have time to go ahead and make up for the recoiling of the guns. The space gets so small, finally he's going to tell Lieutenant Milt, get your section out of here. Of course, friction being on a battlefield, what it is, the first piece that tries to go through the gate clips the wall and overturns in the gate. The escape route is now closed. The next bat gun will literally be driven over the wall. And at that point now, the position is closing in. You can imagine Confederates coming in from the left and Confederates coming in from the right. Even as Bigelow looks at this, he looks at Lieutenant Erickson. He realizes that that wound that he thought wasn't so terrible, Erickson had, had actually been shot through the lungs. If you look at this picture that Charles Wellington Reed draws later, you can see the blood coming out of his mouth. He can only speak at the height of a whisper, and there's blood and froth coming out. In fact, he's going to help Lieutenant Whitaker try and get his battery squared away when he gets shot in the head, and all of a sudden, Christensen's horse will take off into the Confederate lines. Now, Bigelow talks about <coughs> shot raining down here as if it's hail falling. He doesn't realize how much longer that they can stay. Charles Wellington Reed will ride over and say, Captain Bigelow, watch yourself, and he'll see six Confederates over on their left fire a shot. Two shots go wide, two hit Charles Wellington Reed's horse, and two hit John Bigelow, and now he goes down. As he's down on the ground, he sees now Confederates howling, cheering like devils on top of his caissons while his men still work their crew serve weapons. And there for a moment, you'd have Confederates with club muskets and bayonets fighting artillerists with rammer staffs and hand spikes. When finally, Bigelow will give the order, save what you can, leave the guns. In fact, now Charles Wellington Reed, for the first time, realizes those days of training back in Washington that that old tyrant had given him had been preparing him for a day just like this. As he gets him back up on a horse, he will start to ride back towards the Union lines. Except Brigolo says, you're kidding me. I can't do this. If you ride like that, you'll kill me. And Reed goes, okay, okay. And so what he'll do is he'll slow down to a walk. 
and it'll start to walk big load back. You can imagine the artillerist now back at the newly forming artillery line going, get down, get out of the way. And Reed's like, go ahead, boys, just go ahead and fire. Can't be any worse than where we just came from. <laughs> and finally, what's going to happen, he notices that all of a sudden the Confederates stop firing and he hears cheering and it's Union artillerists. And then he realizes also back behind him, there's also cheering from the Confederates. Charles Wellington Reed will walk, walk John Bigelow all the way back to the far tree line and save his life. And for these actions, of course, Charles Wellington Reed will be awarded the Medal of Honor. <laughs> when we think about the scorecard for the 9th Massachusetts, they have 104 men and 110 horses starting July 2nd, 1863. They're going to suffer 29 casualties. Three of the four officers are down, six of the eight sergeants are down, 19 of their enlisted are killed. 88 of the horses are shot down in this position. And I think we have some photographic evidence. Well, I think we do. Thank you, Doug. Awesome. Can you repeat wow. those casualty numbers? Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so big big groups like this are not conducive to photos. So we'll ask you, I'll, I'll, pa I'll be glad to pass these around after I show each one. Plus, we're live streaming this on the American Battlefield Trust YouTube channel so you can get a better view of them. But I think you're familiar with what I mean. Photographer Alexander Gardner came here about three days after the Battle of Gettysburg and recorded photos here at the Trussell Farm. Now, here, are, here are, is a composite of two of them. He probably took five or six in total, depending on how you count them, because he took big versions and little versions, 3D versions and 2D versions and whatnot. And, you know, so this is the kind of them together. It shows the Trussell Farm here and it shows uh, the, both the house and the barn. It shows some of the area, all the area, where we are standing right now, okay? Maybe I can hand this to one of these guys and you can get some eyeballs on it a little bit better. Now, the better known of the two probably are the ones that show the barn. Obviously, that barn is behind me there, okay? And famously in this photograph, of course you could see it on July 6th, 1863, is the artillery shell hole that you can still see to this day below the right diamond, okay? Cool stuff, okay? Um, now, Alexander Gardner and his crew had probably already recorded all of their photos of the dead. The more than 40 photos of the dead recorded here, which is a full 39% of all the photos of the dead ever recorded on battlefields. Gettysburg has the most, okay? Most of the ones of the dead, all the ones we know of are taken south of here, all the ones that we've confirmed at least. And then he probably moved on to other types of carnage. Carnage sells. It sells now and it sold then and it sells on eBay to this day, you see a photo with something dead in it, it's gonna cost you more money, don't bid against me. Now, <laughs> in, in, in blowing up uh, these photos, you can zoom in and see individual boulders. And I'll point to this handsome gentleman right there who is straddling the rock I'm focusing in on right now. Do you see how there's a divot in the center of it there? I'm sorry, in the center. And if you look at the center of that rock, Right above it is the corner of the Trosso barn. All you have to do then is walk backward from that triangulation, not into the road, if there's any cars around, and then you can line that up yourself. Um, as Tim Smith was talking about in a uh, presentation about Gettysburg's boulders, which I just wish he called Gettysburg Rocks. I mean, it's the perfect title, okay? Um, you know, he talks about that. What, is re what do we really have left from the battle? We have some of the houses, um, we have, you know, some of the stuff that was here. Uh, we have some witness trees. I say 12. Some people say 6,000. Okay. Uh, and we have boulders. And I like to talk about witness boulders a lot. Of course, what people focus on with these pictures more than anything else is the terrible carnage. Some of those 88 horses that became casualties as part of Bigelow's battery here. Okay. Mm. Now, while you're gazing upon this ghastly heap here, let me maybe ask, uh, or let me suggest, that these uh, horses were too big to bury, of course. They were gathered together in huge heaps, and then they were burned, okay? Any young people here, let's say you have to be under 17, want to guess how they gathered horses together into big heaps? Are you under 17, sir? <laughs> Anyone have thoughts? I don't want to put them on the spot. No, that's that's a little off. I wonder, anybody have any idea? How do you drag horses together? With other horses. Oh my God, it's horrifying, right? Imagine that. Somehow that seems worse than people 
bringing other <laughs> dead people off to burial. So they gathered them together, and in by far the most over-the-top sentence I've ever been involved in, when they, as flames consumed those grisly remains, a fetid fog of foulness rose from those grotesque pyres and cast a pall of putrefaction over the deluge of death at Gettysburg. <laughs> it was just, thank you, celebration. Uh, Shakespearean. You even. could smell this place miles away. Okay, uh, you could smell the armies before they came, after they left, it was much worse, especially days after, after the blazing midsummer sun cooked the pot of Ophal, that is the human body, that is uh, horse carcasses, and it was just unbelievable. Into those carcasses go millions um, of flies, and then the maggots that come out of them, sorry, I'm not good on fly uh, reproduction, and the flies are gonna come out, and every fence post is covered in town two weeks after the battle, after they sort of, uh, you know, mm. gestated, God, I gotta stop this, this line of stuff, I just don't know the right words, uh, into that, okay? So this was a terrible place to be, and this captured the attention of photographers. Taking five photos like this or so um, is a big chore. Okay, this is going to take upwards of an hour or two. You will take more photos during this tour than photographers took during the Civil War of Gettysburg. Okay, many of you are spending more time on the battlefield during this anniversary than the soldiers did during the battle. Okay, it's a tough thing to wrap your brain around the idea of being more familiar with this place than the soldiers were. Okay, um, and by all means, pass those around so people can see them. Um, I don't care. If they get lost or you end up with them, if they make it back to me, that's fine. Now, let me focus on another photo here, and that's a photo of the house. You'll see that the house is under construction at the time. They are adding the addition, which you can see is now complete, of course, to this day. Okay, and you'll be able to see some of those same horses from a different angle. Um, you're seeing some of the rocks on which some of us are lounging here. I'll get into that in a second. Okay. And you're seeing a little bit more of the battlefield behind. In some of these shots, if you blow up the background, you can see, you know, sort of part of the Kadori thicket. You can even see little bits of Cemetery Ridge. So let me encourage you to take your favorite photos, go to Library of Congress, download the highest resolution one. If you're not a nerd, that's okay. Just download the one with the highest numbers, and you're going to end up with a photo that you can zoom into five, six, seven times. And man, the best blow up of all of these has to be this one. Because you remember when Doug was talking about crashing through the wall and how one of the limbers turned up? Boom! We have a picture of it. And for my money, when somebody says something during the Civil War and a picture confirms it, or someone on the other side that same week says the same thing, that is historical gold for historians. Because that is when you can confirm an account. You actually see the upturned limber chest. Do you see the broken spot in the wall where they broke through? It's right over there. And we can actually see what it was like. This is one thing that photos can do that no account can do on its own. We can see exactly what it looked like at least three days or four days after this happened. Okay, it's possible that tourists came and messed with the scene a little bit. It's possible when the guns were recaptured by Union soldiers that the scene changed a little bit. But man, for my money here, we are seeing a scene that aligns perfectly with what Doug elucidated so well, okay? One more. Now, there's a pointy rock here, I'm sorry, a pointy monument on a rock here, which is the bane of the existence of many battlefield guides, because we drive by on that road, and what does it say on the other side of that monument? It says, Monument on Culp's Hill. That's all it says, okay? <laughs> and it drives us nuts, okay? I'm trying to point out that that rock is this rock, with all the dead horses in it, on it, or around it, and with the Trosso house in the background, it's actually two rocks you can really see, and it's those two rocks right there. Pretty cool stuff. Okay, you can link it directly to what it was, and you can see the road, United States Avenue, was not here. But seeing something like this allows us to link it, but no, the people who are here really, really want to um, talk about why does it say Monument on Culp Hill? Because that'd be a pretty stupid monument, okay? Well, the reason is, is that the main plaque is on this side of the monument. I'm looking at it now. It says 150th New York. It says that they're here late on July 2nd, 1863. How they are involved with some of the recapture of these cannons, right? But their main monument, for where they really fought most of the time, was on Culp Hill. The reason that it's facing this way is, of course, the road used to be on this side of the wall. Okay? In other words, we're standing, most of us are standing, in the old road. 
<laughs> okay? So, what I'm trying to get at is studying the battle from 1863 is very important, but studying in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, and early 1900s is also important because the veterans came back here, and this is the battlefield they came to know. For those who came back, instead of the two wildly intense days they may have spent here, maybe seeing their friends perish, maybe getting wounded themselves, they might have only been on the battlefield for 40 minutes before they got wounded and left, and then they come back here and they refer to the features on the battlefield in the 1880s and 1890s, including roads like this, okay? And finally, that is why the bane of the guide's existence makes sense that of course they have their plaque facing the road. And because of things like this, this is why a lot of monuments have been moved around the battlefield. Because who wants their monument away from the road or facing away? For whatever reason, this one has never been swiveled around, okay? One last thing, and one last photo. We do have a mystery here, and this is a photo called Unfit for Service, okay? Many of us figure it must have been taken around here. I mean, Alexander Gardner poured plates around here. He's got some dead soldiers. Um, you know, he seems to have some of the guns that are listed on the limber chest you see here. Some people claim to have found it, but all they're doing is lining up, you know, loosely where one road probably is and where it might be, because you can see kind of a road in the background. So just lobbing it out here that we have this mystery here that I will now divest myself of, and you can pass around. Maybe somebody can solve it. I'm going to divest myself of all this right. one too, and I'm going to go crazy all around the way as I, do we leave now? All right, lead us up, gentlemen. One question. Sir. In terms of the gate. Yeah, where's the gate? Gate is right over there. Right where they're breaking through, but it's a little bit inward, right? Corner here. Yeah, yeah. There's not much room. There's literally just enough room for one wagon. Yeah. Good question. We can take questions while we walk, too. Follow, uh... You're on top, right? Yeah, yeah, back the way you came, right? Yep. Yeah. Once you came, sorry. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. That's, that's, that's all I can do. It's, it's right back. Yeah. I didn't get to meet him, but I, I got to see him get on somewhere back in. There was a lot, there was a lot of You know the government, federal government didn't take time to move those rocks.
All right, just to reorient you very quickly, off to my right, that is the Daniel Klingel Farm you might see out there. That's the Emmitsburg Road. That is, uh, you might see some cars out there that's looking out towards the west, towards the Confederate line. Directly in front of me is the Peach Orchard, just to the south, southwest of where we're standing. Trosso Farm, Cemetery Ridge, and you might actually be able to see just behind this large tree, Cemetery Ridge, out towards the Father Corby, or Fair Catch Corby as we call him, uh, monument up there on Cemetery Ridge. Uh, the town itself, just to the north, I can see the top of the Taj Mahal looking memorial. That's the Pennsylvania Memorial, the largest on the battlefield. So this is the area we're standing in. William Barksdale's men, the Confederates who are cracking the, sh the nut that is this uh, salient, are moving in two different pieces. Off to my right, the 17th, 13th, and, and uh, 18th Mississippi are moving up the Emmitsburg Road roughly across these fields. Eventually, they're going to make contact with Union soldiers down in what we call the Kadori Thicket. Moving off in this direction will be the 21st Mississippi, commanded by Benjamin Humphreys. 54 years young, he's the closest thing to a West Point graduate in charge of one of Barksdale's brigades, or uh, one of Barksdale's regiments. In fact, Humphreys has been kicked out of West Point during the eggnog, eggnog riot of the 1820s. He was uh, one of 70 cadets brought up on charges and one of roughly 26 that were kicked out of West Point. There were some other guys there at the time when this was happening, like Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and some others. But he is going to be expelled, come out to serve in the American Civil War, and here at the battle is the head of the 21st Mississippi. The 21st is moving through the Peach Orchard. As they're moving through the Peach Orchard towards Bigelow's guns, a man named uh, Isaac Stamps, he is a lieutenant within Company D, 21st Mississippi, he is coming across the battlefield carrying a Mexican-American War era sword. That is the sword of his uncle, a guy named Jefferson Davis. He is President Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy. He's out here, stamps is, carrying his uncle's sword on the battlefield. As he comes across the peach orchard towards where we're standing, stamps is hit in the bowels by a bullet. Knocked out of action, mortally wounded. Another man will be coming across with Company D, James Ramjour. He's a first lieutenant. He's shot in the hand, he's shot in the mouth. He sticks with his command. He can't say a word, but he keeps using his hands to usher his men forward. One man on, on Barksdale's staff will say that he, don't, he doesn't think that he gave any other orders, Barksdale himself, other than forward, forward, or press them, keeping them going. And Barksdale's men, as I said at the beginning, they have means, they have will, but they're running out of power. Because the 21st breaks off and comes into this area. As they're coming into this area, they're going to be pressuring Bigelow's guns. We have Joker Shaw's South Carolinians coming from the south. We now have coming in from the west-ish, the 21st Mississippi. That real estate's getting smaller and smaller. Bigelow will claim that no Confederate got within it in his gun line. Well, they may not have got within his gun line, but they did get on top of his limber chest. <laughs> and running up into their limber chest will be uh, George Kempton of Company I, the 21st. He dives on the limber chest, claims that for the Mississippians. Then a man from Company E, William McNeely, will jump on the next limber chest, claim that for that company. Eventually, Barksdale's men, specifically the 21st Mississippi, will capture the better part of Bigelow's guns down in this area. <coughs> this is vindication for Barksdale's men. The 18th Mississippi, who's on Barksdale's right, a large portion of it was forced to surrender on May 3rd, 1863 at 2nd Fredericksburg. They even lost their flag. Their colonel, their, his executive officer, are both captured. They're both back here in time for Gettysburg, but they also lost some guns of the Washington Artillery of New Orleans, Louisiana. So now these guys are kind of making up for what happened at 2nd Fredericksburg. They wanted those guns back. But the 21st, in the meantime, will now turn to meet their next threat, a battery that's off and across in that direction towards South Hancock Avenue. As this is playing out, 
the 13th, the 17th, and the, tw and, and the 18th Mississippi are moving off in that direction with William Barksdale. Barksdale is cursing at his men, telling them to go forward, according to some accounts. And they keep sweeping up unit after unit of Federals. But unit cohesion is starting to break down. Barksdale's charge here was one of the most magnificent charges of the war, according to one man. But it comes at a high price. Of the 1,600 Mississippians who step off here on July 2nd, 1863, 49% of them were casualties, killed, wounded, or missing. Just to give you an idea of what that looks like in your high command, the 13th Mississippi lost their colonel, their major, their two highest ranking officers. The 17th Mississippi, they will lose their colonel, their lieutenant colonel, an acting major, another acting major. They'll also lose Gwen Cherry, the, guys who, the guy who voluntold his men to go out and take down those fences. And they will lose a large number of other men out on this field. The 18th Mississippi will lose their colonel, William Griffin, and his second in command, William Luss. It's been a bad two battles for those two guys, captured at 2nd Fredericksburg and now wounded here at Gettysburg. Most of the casualties within Barksdale's brigade, though, will be inflicted on those three regiments moving up that road, then off to, the, off to my right, and then towards Cemetery Ridge, because they kept engaging unit after unit, and Barksdale kept bringing them deeper and deeper into the heart of the Union defenses. The next division in line, Richard Heron Anderson's division of A.P. Hill's Corps, will move off with a few of his brigades. Uncle Billy Fixin, a guy named Cadmus Wilcox, will move forward. He wears a straw hat into action, a little short coat, and he goes charging across the fields, and he will meet a unit that we know as the 1st Minnesota to the north of us. He'll later complain to his division commander, Anderson, never crossed the road out here. He is going to, he and another general will basically kind of say he was somewhat cowardice. Though there's not a lot of evidence to back that up other than they're grumbling afterwards. A Florida brigade will move forward as well under David Lang. They will keep pressing forward. But they're losing momentum. They're losing cohesion. Longstreet and Hill are not working together. Lee's not out here actively telling them what to do. In the midst of all of this, William Barksdale is shot from his horse. There's a variety of, of uh, accounts of how he was wounded here mortally on the Gettysburg battlefield. He's shot three times and he falls somewhere down in the Kodori thicket. According to Norman J. Hall, a Union colonel in the 2nd Army Corps, brigade commander, he claimed that he, they dropped 20 yards in front of the 7th Michigan Infantry. That's near the center of the Union line. Joseph Carr, uh, Joseph Carr a 3rd Corps brigade commander, claims that men of the 1st Massachusetts and the 26th Pennsylvania went out and they found Barksdale down in a hollow and abandoned by his men. Barksdale will then be captured, curse out the Yankees in some harsh words as they say, not very happy that he was captured and is taken back to the Hummelbaugh farm which is today along Pleasanton Avenue behind the Pennsylvania Memorial. There's a fantastic quote from the 33rd New York Infantry. It was written in 1864 when they wrote their regimental history. This is in the midst of the war. They fought against Barksdale at 2nd Fredericksburg. And they will state that William Barksdale will die on the crimson fields of Gettysburg. Well, let me, let me back up. The haughty and supercilious Barksdale. <laughs> will die on the crimson fields of Gettysburg without even a slave to bring him a cold cup of water abandoned by his own men. The irony in this quote is when he's taken to the rear, he's tended to by a guy named Robert Cassidy of the 148th Pennsylvania, who is a union musician and who brings him water and whiskey and tends to him in his last hours. When they give Barksdale water, they stated that it came out of his chest, out of the wound. It was so deep. He died on July 3rd, 1863 at the Hummelbaugh farm. He was buried nearby under a cherry tree. 
Humphrey uh, or um, uh, Cassidy later writes to the widow Barksdale, a lady named Narcissa Barksdale. Fantastic first name for a Harry Potter fan. <laughs> and he's going to state where he was buried. Eventually, Harris Barksdale, the nephew of William Barksdale, who's on his staff here, comes back, uh, uh, sends word up here to Gettysburg to send the body down to South Carolina. And then eventually it's sent to Jackson, Mississippi, where it lies down in, in Jackson, the state capital there. But Barksdale, he's knocked out of action. Most of his high command's out of action. Lee's men have come to their high water mark for July 2nd, 1863. So, very uh, cognizant of the time, let's talk about the Union reaction to this. Certainly when Sickles gets killed, what happens is Meade makes the next reaction, which he's going to give Winfield Scott Hancock command of the Union Center. So what he's going to do now is they're going to start band-aiding together the defense back behind us, using individual batteries and supporting by individual regiments of infantry. Hancock will go up and find Willard's Brigade, all the way up almost beyond the copse of trees, up by the Abraham Bryant farm. Bring them down. They're going to counterattack down in the valley, 125th, 126th, known as Harper's Ferry's cowards. They also have a chip on their shoulder. I would argue they're the ones that kill Barksdale. Of course, now, as those next dominoes come, those men from Alabama, he brought up the 1st Minnesota, supported by Thomas's battery. As, as Hancock will launch Willard's Brigade down here, he'll ride up and go find Colonel Colville, and he'll go, my God, are these all the men you have? And he's right, it's an understrength regiment. It's only eight companies, it's 262 men. He'll turn to Colville and say, do you see those flags pointing those Alabamans? He says, yes, sir. He says, take those flags. Not a man in the regiment doesn't know what's being asked. So Colville will give the command, fix bayonets, they'll come down in the valley. At first, they'll push over a fence, and then they'll go to a double quick. When they get 25 yards prior to where we find this uh, scrub brush down here, they'll deliver a volley, and with a Yankee hurrah, they slam into the Confederate lines. So vicious, so unexpected, the Confederates are stunned. But 262 against 1,600 are crummy odds. By the time they get back up to the, the ridge line, they take a head count, they have 47. That 82% loss is the highest percentage loss of any regiment here at Gettysburg. I'd argue it's the second highest percentage loss of any regiment during the American Civil War. So when we study this battle, what I suggest is suspend that you know how it turned out. At about 7.05 on the evening of July 2nd, 215 lives are worth five minutes on this battlefield. What's your life worth? It's interesting to think about why we talk about this will thing. When the first Minnesota goes down in the valley, what is their expectation? Their expectation is they're going to go down there and buy five minutes. And that some other unit should show up on the top of that ridge line. Why would you believe that in the Army of the Potomac? That hasn't happened before. And think about it, when they go down, the only person they can see is Winfield Scott Hancock. Napoleon says leaders are dealers in hope. When they go, their expectation is they look at Hancock and go, we're going to go down there and buy five minutes. And that guy, that guy will find somebody else. And of course, if somebody else is the first Corps Division Reserve, Newton will ride up and say, hey, General Meade, everything is okay. And of course it is. So. If we read our Karl von Clausewitz, a good military theorist, he would say, a defense is not a shield, it's not just a shield, but a shield made up of well-directed blows. When we see this Union line collapse in front of us, it is a series of well-directed blows that come out here and ultimately stop this Confederate attack on July 2nd, 1863. Any thoughts from the back to close out, gang? Um, yes. This is a super involved thing to say. Y'all, thanks so much for coming out today. Uh, <laughs> thanks to Doug and Chris for bearing the load of almost this entire tour on this hot day to be with us and for really participating in Gettysburg 160. This stuff is special to so many of us here. It's an odd thing to come to a battlefield to both honor and experience and have fun at the same time on a battlefield. And obviously this is a crew that likes to do that. So we'll be around for at least six minutes to take any questions you have. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks to Sarah for filming. And thanks for supporting Battlefield Education.